Hello, and welcome to the Josh Sweeney Podcast. I am your host, Josh Sweeney, and joining us on this episode is Josh Pauls. Josh, thank you for taking the time to be here today. Oh, thanks for having me, Josh. <laughs> Josh, Josh. Uh, yeah, no problem. Um, for those of you listening that don't know, Josh is a three-time Paralympian in 2010, 2014, and 2018 in the sport of sled hockey, and he is also fortunate enough during that time to be a three-time gold medalist. Uh, he's been on the team since 2009. He is currently still on the team as the captain of the team, and he has recently finished writing a book about his life and experiences called Lessons Learned that we will discuss later in this episode, but uh, he's basically just been on a roll ever Ever since 2009, you've just been killing it. How are you feeling? I mean, I'm feeling great right now. Um, you know, there have been some ebbs and flows throughout my career, but, you know, it's, it's been good to kind of, you know, start high winning a gold medal in 2009 and continuing that pretty much the entire way through. You just, you just win. You just get on the team, and next thing you know, you guys are just winning. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying that I started it, but, you know, our fortune changed when I made the team, even when I – was be, being benched for most of it. So I'm not saying it was me, but it certainly didn't hurt. <laughs> right. And I just, I just finished up talking with uh, Taylor Lipset on episode two of this podcast. And um, it was funny because we were talking about his accomplishments with, with two gold medals and how amazing that was going back to back. And then I was excited to hear from you about winning three and we'll cover that in a little bit too. But um, I guess First thing I want to ask before we even get into anything else is when you think of the amount of time that you've spent playing on the team and all of it together, everything culminating as a professional sled hockey player, what's the first thing you think of? I mean, the first thing I think of is probably Coach Sauer. Um, he was somebody that had a tremendous impact on my career and on the team as a whole. And so, you know, he's always going to be that one unifying factor that I can really think fondly back on because he helped make sled hockey fun for me again. Awesome. Yeah, he was definitely an amazing coach. The only coach, well, I guess that's not true since I went back last year, but he was my main professional sled hockey career coach. And definitely, I, I think I am the, well, turned into the sled hockey player I was because of him. So, yep. Awesome. Thank you, Coach Sauer, if, uh, you know, you get these waves, however that works. But moving on from that, you were born in, where are you from? Jersey? I'm um, originally from Greenbrook, New Jersey, so uh, don't hold that against me, please. <laughs> so what was that like growing up in Jersey? And And I guess, I mean, I guess we can just talk about it. You were born with this disability, maybe we should just start there since we're going to have to start there since that was the beginning. So tell me about, uh, your disability and what happened. Yeah. I mean, it was basically the, the very beginning. I mean, um, I popped out of the womb and uh, the doctors kind of looked at me. They said my legs were a little bow legged. So they threw me in a couple casts and, you know, told my parents, Hey, this happens with a lot of kids. And, uh, they took some x-rays and realized that I wasn't just like most other kids. I uh, had a condition known as tibial hemamelia. It's a, it's a mouthful to say. So it's really a fancy word for saying I was missing my shin bones. Um, I had a couple of missing feet bones and kneecaps, stuff like that. But the biggest thing was I didn't have my tibias, which are your, the primary weight bearing bone in your shin. And so for me, um, I would never really be able to walk. Um, I'd end up probably breaking my leg more, more often than not. And so uh, when I was 10 months old, my parents made what I think is what was one of the best decisions I've ever had made. Um, they chose to have my legs amputated above the knee. Um, so I still have my femur, but I don't have anything below that. And now I walk around with prosthetics. And I mean, just the way my, uh, my life's turned out and the career I've been able to have in sled hockey, I think it's, it's really helped me become the person that I am today. And um, I think, I don't think without, with the support of, uh, without the support of my parents or everybody I grew up with, I don't think I'd be where I am today or probably even be on the show. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. You know, you think about 
first when you see somebody like yourself, you think about like, oh, he doesn't have legs. That's got to be really hard. And you don't really know the, the, the full story of how that works or, or how it happened. And then when you find out it was at birth, then you start thinking, oh man, those parents, that must've been, been difficult. But after talking with you and, and just, I mean, we've known each other. So knowing you, uh, I'm sure you're, I guess hard, I don't want to call it hard headedness, but perseverance or, um, uh, willpower strength, uh, internal strength comes from your parents. I'm sure. Oh yeah. I mean, they kind of set the bar for where I was at. I mean, you know, I'd always try to get away with, you know, Hey Josh, take the garbage out. Well, sorry, I don't have my legs on. Mom would be like, all right, well you better put those darn things on and go take the garbage out. Like they didn't really let me get away with anything. And so for me, um, it was really about taking on their qualities and understanding, you know, what they were trying to help me become because in the long run, it was going to help me become a better person and ultimately help me become, you know, I'll make it onto the national team. And, you know, they were the ones that encouraged me to, to play sled hockey, um, even just to give it a try, even if it was just for fun, because they wanted me to, to get into something that I could be passionate about. And it just so happened that sled hockey was the thing and I got pretty good at it and made the national team. And um, I definitely wouldn't have had the career without their support. And, you know, one of the things I've thought about over the years is, you know, they've really shown me what sacrifice is like because, and I'm not even talking about, you know, what they had to do. Cause you know, they had to do some different stuff. I'm sure for me, like shopping and uh, like shoe shopping was probably really different for them uh, for me than most other kids. But, you know, my parents have been divorced since I think I was in fourth grade and they've still attended every single Paralympic games together. And, you know, I, you know, whenever I'm sure, you know, Josh, when we win that gold medal and you look into the stands, you're looking for your friends and family and they've always been right next to each other. And that means more to me than I think anything. That's really cool. That's awesome. And so how was shopping for shoes different? Um, so most of the time my mom didn't feel like dealing with, you know, young, young me. And so what she'd do is she'd just take my prosthetic and bring it into the shoe store and leave me and my dad in the car so that she didn't have to deal with squirming, uh, running around active little Josh. So, um, I'm sure she got some weird looks from some of the people working the, the shoe store, but you know, it worked for her and it worked for my parents. And so it, I def, it's definitely not uh, typical to just bring a leg in, but uh, it worked for us. <laughs> yeah, that's that's such a cool – and honestly, right then and there, we're already talking about adapting to the situation, figuring out what works best, what's going to get the job done the fastest, the most convenient. And uh, so, I mean, from the time that it took – or that you had to start getting shoes, I, you know, she was already kind of showing you, hey – it's okay that you're not going to go in with me. This is how I'm going to do it. And I'm sure as a young kid, you, you saw that without even realizing it. Oh, definitely. I mean, most of the things that, you know, I've learned, you know, my book's called lessons learned and it kind of talks a little bit about what I've learned over the years, but most of those things I didn't even realize that I'd learned about them until I'd written it down and put it to paper because, you know, you don't always reflect um, on different events in your life, but to be able to write a book was really awesome. And in that regard, but, you know, for her, I mean, it was just the most efficient, easiest way to do it. And that kind of transferred to how I operate. I want to try to find the easiest, quickest, most efficient way to get things done because, you know, living with prosthetics, it's not always the easiest, but it, you know, gives me my mobility. And, you know, I wouldn't doubt that there are some, uh, some parents out there wishing they could just take their kid's legs in um, instead of having to bring the whole kid, if, especially if they're active and running around. Yeah, I I have two kids, as you know, and there's definitely days I'm like, oh, I wish I could just not bring you in, but I need to. <laughs> yeah, you can't exactly leave them out in the car. No. Um, and so what was that? I mean, how, what, how old were you when you started using prosthetics? Um, I was about a year old when I started using them. And wow. so for me, I kind of progressed up probably similar to how most people progress, uh, you know, whether you're born um, with a disability or you lose your limbs later in life. Um, I progressed through what's called a stubby. So basically I had a piece of carbon around my, and plastic around my uh, residual limb. So around my femur and that gave my prosthetic hold. And then it's a, basically a little block on the end. So I don't really have a foot. I don't really, I'm not really standing up real tall, but you know, I'm a year old, so I don't really need to be that tall. That's kind of how I learned how to walk. And then the progression starts with, you know, I got, 
longer legs that would match just about the height I would be at whatever age I was. Um, those had feet on them. And then the knees didn't bend just because um, with the technology back then, it, they were more of a hazard. And I'd probably end up falling more than I'd stay up if I had them when I was younger. Yeah. Then you progress to prosthetics with knees. Um, and now I'm lucky enough to have things that have microprocessors, gyroscopes, you know, these things do everything, but um, walk me home from the rink every day. Yeah. And for anyone listening, I think the only time I've seen Josh in a wheelchair is borrowing, well, you know, during sled uh, national team camps and trips and stuff is during downtime in the hotel when he's borrowing someone else's chair that doesn't use prosthetics all the time. And so when you're, you know, thinking about, or, or if this is somebody listening that maybe walks with prosthetics and, and thinks like, Oh, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to, to wear these all the time. You know, he, he is somebody that does. And, and with that, do you have any, um, anything to add to that? Yeah. I mean, I actually don't end up, I don't own a wheelchair anymore. Um, I got rid of it. I think when I moved into an apartment that I was on like the top floor, which, you know, hindsight wasn't really fun. Um, but <laughs> it was what I could get at the time. And now, I mean, I pretty much use my prosthetics all the time. I don't really ever use wheelchairs unless like you said, like, you know, we're at the hotel and I, we we're all going to the sauna or the pool and I want to want to get down there because I don't want to get my legs wet or anything like that. But, you know, I'm, I know I'm fortunate because I grew up and that was the only way I knew how to walk. But I think what that ended up doing that can help a lot of people, even if, you know, you know how to walk with, you know, flesh legs, um, it, it's a mindset thing. You know, this was my mindset as a kid was, this is how I'm going to get around. So this is how I'm going to get around. I have to figure this out. I didn't really want to take an out uh, with a wheelchair. And so, you know, it's all, it all comes down to mindset. If you want to do something, you're going to do it. It may not always be the easiest and you know, I know that I'm fortunate because I can bear weight on the end of my uh, residual limb. So that does help with like my prosthetic fit. Um, but, you know, it's not always the easiest. It's not always, you know, the most fun, especially when you're starting out. Um, but probably the biggest thing that I learned from just prosthetics in general was if it ever truly hurts, it's not just like, oh, my leg's a little sore. If it ever hurts, you just need to go into your guy and, or guy or girl and say, fix this. Like, because a prosthetic should never hurt you. It, Got it. You know, it might be sore. It might not be the most comfortable all the time, but those are things that need to be hammered out and you got to be, you got to be able to advocate for yourself in that regard. Cool. All right. So moving on from prosthetics, growing up as a kid, before you got into sled hockey, was there any other sports that you played? Yeah, I really didn't play much else. I uh, ended up trying wheelchair basketball. I know that's a pretty popular one in the States at least, but um, I really just participated in gym classes, and that was about the the furth- fur- furthest extent that I went to uh, for sports before sled hockey. Okay, and then when you got into sled hockey, how old were you? I was ten when I first, uh, or I was eight when I first saw my first game, and then I was ten when I started playing competitively. And how did you get? Was it like a come out and try sled hockey day? Um, so a team from South Jersey ended up coming up near my area and they played an, a, an able-bodied team in sled. Um, so my parents saw that flyer. They wanted to get me out. Uh, so we watched the game. I got to hop in a sled and I, I hated it. Like, I don't know what it was. If like, it was cause all the attention was on me and I was one of the only ones in the sled on the ice at the time. I just didn't like it at all. And then, uh, two years later, a team started a little bit closer to my house. And so it was actually feasible for my parents to drive me. And they said, hey, why don't you just give it one more try? We'll take you one time. If you don't like it, you don't have to stay in it. And something changed, and I just, I absolutely loved it. And so, you know, I started playing with a team called the Woodbridge Warriors. Uh, That's kind of where I got my start. And, you know, my parents ended up driving me all over New Jersey, Pennsylvania, uh, went up to New York a couple times just to head to as many camps as possible and get as much exposure and coaching because, you know, we were a brand new program in Woodbridge. And so uh, we didn't really know the ins and outs of the sport. And that's where I got introduced to, to a guy named uh, Mike Doyle, who looked at me real funny one time and said, Hey, are your, uh, your prosthetics fa- or your legs fake? And he said, I said, yeah. It's like, why don't you take them off? Cause I was wearing them in a sled oh my God. and I never realized that that was even an option. And so once I took those off and got rid of that dead weight on the, on the end of the sled, I ended up having so much more fun. 
<laughs> so the reason you hated it in the first place was because you were wearing these big old prosthetic legs in the sled, right? I almost guarantee it. Oh, so man. I'm really glad he, he looked at me all weird. Well, for anyone listening, you know, that's, that's a good point anyway. Um, and personally, I can relate. When you first start playing sled hockey, it's not a sport that you jump into and think, oh, my gosh, I'm having so much fun. I can't wait to come back and do this again. Uh, I think it's mm-hmm. a, I think it's a sport that you, you go out and you play and you say, wow, that was really hard. I think I want to come out and try it again. I like the people that I'm playing with. This seems like it could be okay. And then it turns into after about, you know, I don't know, I'd say maybe five, six practices, it turns into, okay, now I want to perfect this. I, don't you agree? Oh, hands down. I mean, in St. Louis, I'm in St. Louis now and, we always tell people you're going to suck the first time you're in a sled. You're like, you're not going to be very good. And, <laughs> um, but you know, it's the locker room that keeps people coming back. But you know, when people are able to, to try it a couple of times and finally get it down, that's when you see the, like you said, the light bulbs clicking and like, Oh, okay. I actually know how to turn. Um, people ask me how to stop all the time. And most of the time I'm like, don't even worry about it. Just run into the boards your first couple of times. You'll be okay. <laughs> you're wearing pads. Um, but it's not something that, easy especially at the beginning and i think part of it it's part of why you know we may not get as many numbers after the first practice when people come to try it of people coming back but yeah. that's how you know who the people that are truly dedicated to it are yeah very true it's not an easy sport and you can't you can't come in looking for a free ride if you want to play on a team so that's um that's very true now from there you start playing on this team practicing what happened between then and going to um, some kind of USA team function? Um, so I went to a couple USA hockey development camps. Um, so for those that are not familiar, it's basically for the best up and coming 60 ish um, players in the country. So anybody that isn't on the national team already, um, but has some potential, you get nominated by your local coach and, a couple of us from our local team got nominated and went up together. And so I went to uh, just about, I think, two or three of them. And, you know, the first one, I was one of the worst players out there. Um, but by my second and third year, my skill had really progressed to where, you know, I was one of the standouts at the camp. And that really, I think, helped me stand apart from the rest of everybody that, you know, want, was looking to make that national team. And um, then my first event, I... I'd love to tell you I tried out for the team and made it. I actually didn't. Um, I didn't think I was ready. So I just, I was driving home or well, my dad was driving me home because I was 15 at the time. And uh, I get a call from a, the GM called named Dan Brennan. He's like, Hey Josh, uh, just wondering where you are. We're getting ready to start our tryout. I said, Oh, I just, I didn't think I was ready. I'd, I'm going back to New Jersey. He's like, well, uh, we're going to invite you to the first camp and give you your own sort of little tryout. Cause we really like the way you look at the development camp and want to see what's going on. And so I ended up going up to the first, uh, training camp in September of 2008. And, uh, that was kind of my first exposure to guys that, you know, I had idolized uh, over the past couple of years. It was, we ended, I was on the de- U S development team that year, that prior year. And we had our, the annual disabled festival for sled hockey um, up in the same spot that they were having uh, world championships in Marlboro, Massachusetts. So, you know, I went from in April from watching these guys play Norway and Canada to being on the same ice as them. That was just a surreal opportunity. That's amazing. And how, I mean, obviously the tryout went well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how well it went actually, because uh, Bill Sandberg, the uh, equipment manager, actually gave me the jersey I wore, and he's like, "You can just keep that." I don't know if they expected me to be back, but uh, <laughs> a little bit of a little bit of luck happened. Uh, a guy named Alexi Salomon, he uh, ended up breaking his wrist in an ac- in a car accident, and so they were one short of their maximum roster size. And so I kind of hung around. I didn't really play a whole lot that first year. Um, I tell everybody I had the best seat in the house for most of our games because I was riding the pine because uh, I was basically a a fourth line forward on a three line team. And so um, it wasn't the most glorious start, but man, I mean, I was just so excited to, to be on the team with some of those guys. I mean, they were just legends of the sport for at least in my eyes. And then now I'm teammates with them. So I, uh, I ended up make, staying on the team for the rest of that year um, with a little bit of luck and a little help from uh, some unfortunate timing. Yeah. And I mean, that's part of, I think, 
joining a high elite level team anyway. You know, you're not going to be there. You're not going to, it's not like you're going to come up and instantly be thrown right into the mix. And I, I think it's good that it's not that way. Even if you are the better player, even if you are the the best player there is and come onto the team, no one's going to hand it to you. And I think that's, I think that's good. And you probably learned a lot from having to watch. And even though you, I'm sure you didn't enjoy it. Nobody enjoys doing that, but uh, I'm sure it was a good learning experience. Oh, for sure. I mean, I had to change the way I played. I mean, I went from, you know, this offensive guy most of the time to having to play a defensive role because I was only playing, you know, a couple shifts a game. And so I had to make sure that I was taking care of my, the defensive responsibilities that you have before I could even think about offense. So, you know, for me, it was, I, I learned how to be that guy that wasn't playing a whole lot early in my career. And um, then I was able to, to read and watch some of the best at, at what they did. I mean, Al Salomon was one of the best offensive players ever. You know, I got to watch Steve Cash make those ridiculous saves that he always makes. And that was back um, when the team wasn't very good. So he was facing, you know, 30 shots a game and stopping, <laughs> you know, 95% of them. Oh my gosh. Probably most of the time, 98% of them. And so I got to watch some of the best players, whether it was forward or defense, you know, got a guy like Taylor Lips that I got to see him score some crazy goals and, so I think that really helped. And then, I mean, I think the key part to anything is competing against guys in practice and understanding, you know, having that build my confidence level. I was, I went from, there's no way I'm going to be able to stop Taylor on, on this one-on-one -on -one to, well, actually maybe he's not that crazy and maybe I can actually get in his way at least and give our goalie a better, better shot at uh, making that save. Yeah. And, and so then you're on the team you um you're doing well 2010 hits it's a paralympic year do you go to tryouts and instantly make it um i wish well no i i don't want to say i wish cuz uh i mean i really think it helped me in the long run i went to tryouts and um after the the very last uh game scrimmage we had uh the coach called me into a locker room my dad was there and i was like all right this is a little weird but whatever and he said, "Hey, Josh, we're just we're letting you know we're not going to take you on the team this year." So they they had to cut it down to a roster of fifteen. They took eighteen players, and I wasn't one of them. Um, but they said, "He said, you know what? We want you to go down to the development team. We want you to be a leader there. And if anything happens, you'll be the first one we call uh, if we need somebody to come back up." And I mean, that sucked. I was not ha a happy camper, um, but. You know, I remember driving back and my dad was like, well, if you don't like it, just prove them wrong. Because we had a couple uh, tournaments together and a couple sets of games. And so I figured, you know what, I'm just going to work my tail off and I'm going to prove to them that they made the wrong decision. Whether or not they correct it, uh, it's out of my hands. I, I don't make the decision, I'm not the coach. But yeah. I wanted to make sure that they every time they saw me on the ice, they were like, "We this kid should be on our team. Yeah, that's that's totally the right attitude. And so then what? And then, uh, I mean, I keep saying it's luck. And, you know, I've learned over the years that, you know, the harder you work, the more ready you are for the opportunities. Opportunities are around everybody. And it, you just have to be ready for them when they hit. And so uh, we had a surprise retirement out of that year. And uh, I got the call around mid-November to join the team up for a tournament up in Prince Edward Island. And I remember just running around my house. I was just so excited because Dan, <laughs> Dan Brennan, the GM called me and he was like, you got the same chance of, of anybody on this team to make it. And uh, after that tournament, we had a couple more sets of games and uh, I ended up beating out three other guys to make the, the final 15th spot for, on that roster in 2010. And then we went on this stupid, crazy run. Um, we ended up playing five games that Paralympics. Uh, we didn't allow a single goal. I think we only allowed like 30 shots total in all five games. And I think the highest count anybody had against us was Norway with like 11. They were the only ones that reached double digits, I think. Wow. And so to be able to, to play on, on a team and, you know, go to the Paralympics, the pinnacle of the sport was, was fantastic. And to do it in Vancouver, you know, and in, in front of Canadian fans, um, we didn't ever end, end up playing Canada, but it, it was such a great atmosphere. You know, we packed the building of 5,000, uh, pretty much every game we played. And so that was really cool to be able to play in front of a crowd and just to realize that, you know, I'd made it. Like after all that work that I put in to try to make it back onto the team, you know, that was a, a great way to, to finally say, I was just happy to be there. And winning the gold medal was just the icing on the cake. Definitely. And how old were you at this point? Uh, in Vancouver, I was 17. That's amazing. 
you know, you think about the experience of going to the Paralympics and it sounds really cool. And then you think about doing it as a 17 year old and it's like, wow, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I didn't do any homework in Vancouver, but uh, most of my teachers in high school were pretty uh, pretty sympathetic to my cause because the the gold medal helped a little bit, I think. Right, you're when you're when you're winning, you're <laughs> it's all good. So actually, that brings up a good point. How was it juggling school and playing for the USA sled hockey team at the same time? I mean, I probably could have done a better job at it, um, to be honest. But, I mean, it was something that I needed to focus my energy and make sure that I was focusing it at the right times. And, um, you know, I had really good mentors, a guy like Andy Yoey. Um, he was somebody that really kept me in line to make sure that I was getting my schoolwork done because I think part of it was he saw the potential and didn't want me to, in hockey, and didn't want me to waste it by, you know, flunking out of school or anything. So, for me to have other guys on the team, keep me accountable, really helped. And, you know, I got through high school, no problem. I ended up graduating in college uh, from college in 2016. So, you know, it, it, I'm not going to lie. Like these trips now are pretty awesome that I don't have to do homework. Well, I'm <laughs> still doing homework for my NBA. So it, I guess it doesn't really count. I haven't totally gotten there yet, but you know, it's, it's not always the most fun thing to, you know, do some homework instead of taking a nap or to miss out on, you know, a couple of games of NHL 19 or 20, whatever the boys are playing on Xbox. But, you know, it's, it's worthwhile because I know that, you know, oh, at least I hope I'm still going to make the team in a, in a few years and I'll still be able to have those moments all the while getting my school done and making sure that I'm taking care of that priority. Because, you know, as much as I'd love to play on the team until I'm like 90, um, it's really not realistic. And so I got to make sure I have a backup plan and school is one way that I could, I could have that plan. Well, I mean, if Rico can do it, you can do it. <laughs> He's going to love me. Yeah. For that he one. is the old man of the group. <laughs> right. Uh, so you win a gold medal at your first Paralympics. It's awesome experience. You're feeling good. Do you, I guess, what is your, outlook moving forward going towards 2014 i mean were you just like cool this is what i'm doing from now on because i want to come back and i love playing this sport and 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 i'm just going to do what i need to do to be here i'm sort of i mean in 2011 i got a, a little bit bigger role i ended up moving back to my normal position of defenseman and so i got to to play a little bit more regularly because it was an off year so there was no world championship or paralympics and it was a chance for me to get kind of get some more experience but uh, over the course of that year, like our coach, he was a really hard guy. Um, he just wasn't a great people person. Um, and so he kind of wore on me. And, uh, I remember during the very last game we played, or I guess the semifinal game we played against Norway in a 14 tournament. And uh, I was defending a two on one and the puck went in, went in off my stick past our goalie. And that was, ended up being the game winning goal. And I just, I felt awful. And I remember our coach coming in and he went in and said, Hey, maybe we just haven't, didn't have the right guys on the ice. And, you know, for me, that really, that really struck me hard. I don't know if he meant it at me or not, but I took it pretty rough. And so I wanted to, I wanted to be better. Um, but he ended up not making it out of that season. He ended up getting fired. And then we brought in coach Sauer, who we talked about a little bit earlier. And um, so for me, coach Sauer, he was, he was somebody that just had that infectious smile and he really, made sure that you had fun coming to the rink. I mean, I'm sure you remember we'd he'd throw out a tennis ball on the ice and say, all right, go warm up. I mean, it's just, it was a, you know, a seven on six game or whatever it might be. And he really made sure that he wanted to make sure that you were learning something. You were working hard, but you know, you were having fun while you were doing it because that's, I think the key to it. Cause if you don't enjoy what you're doing, you're not going to put in every bit, last bit of effort that you have. And so for me, he really revitalized the, my career and the passion I had for sled hockey, especially at the highest level, because I don't think I was ever in danger of quitting hockey forever. Yeah. Um, it was just more the national team grind. It, it wasn't as fun. And for me, I need something to be fun if I'm going to put any kind of effort into it. And leading into, into Sochi, you know, we ended up winning the world championship in 2012. Um, we lost on a bad bounce in 2013. Um, and that's kind of, where I guess 2013 was where I really ended up making a, a splash in, in the world stage. I ended up playing on one of our top lines. And uh, that was where I really got the chance to, you know, have my offensive talent come through. But overall, it was just accumulation of hard work and making sure that, you know, 
I was taking care of stuff at home so that I could be the best I could be when we did have those limited opportunities because, you know, on the national team, that's what it is. It's a four day camp here, a three day camp here, a 10 game, 10 day tournament somewhere. Um, There's not a whole lot of time together as a team. So you got to make sure that you're working hard at home and improving your skills there because you don't always have time when you're with the national team. It's there. It's time to execute. It's time to play and time to win. Yeah. And, and during those times when you're playing, you know, you, you, it's, it feels like a long game when you're watching, but man, when you're playing, you feel like you have no time on the ice. <laughs> well, I mean, actually I take that back. I think you get a little more time than the rest of us, but uh, I know, I know for myself, it was like putting in all this work and all this training just to get on the ice for a minute and get right back off so that the next guy could come out. And that's just the way the sport is, but it, it's definitely, I understand. And I'm sure people at home listening, you, I mean, you explained it very well. You're, you're doing a lot, you know, 90% of it, I would say is, is outside of our camps and games or, and then, and then in, once you start actually getting on the national team, it's just, you, you just get those opportunities that you have to take advantage of. And if you don't, then next season. Yep, exactly. And nobody, there's no worse feeling than sitting there going, ah, we'll get them next year. Yeah, I always <laughs> yeah. love the, you know what, let's just repeat next year. That's the, that's a lot better feeling for me at least. Or just not even think of it, just being, just patting yourself on the back. Yep, that was a good one. <laughs> yep. <Yeah. laughs> so that's definitely the best. I won't argue there. Right. So you graduate high school during that time between 2010 and 2014, correct? And yep. do you, what happened? you relocate down to uh, St. Louis? Yeah, so I uh, Taylor Lips had actually ter- uh, mentioned that he was, planning on going to Lindenwood University. It's a small private college in, um, St. Uh, right around, right outside of St. Louis, Missouri. And so, uh, I checked it out. I ended up, uh, taking a visit there and I loved it. And so, uh, I signed there. I wanted to play there. They, there was big talk about them putting together a, a college sled team. Uh, it never actually materialized, but I got to play, uh, with the best goalie in the world, Steve Cash. He's the U S goalie. And, uh, so he's from St. Louis as well. So, I uh, ended up joining their program and then uh, got my BA in uh, sport management at Lindenwood uh, from 2011 to 2016. Uh, you know, got to take that victory lap because, you know, you don't want to spend too much time in school. You got to actually train for hockey every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So 2014 rolls around, you go to tryouts, you're pretty much a veteran on the team at this point. Well, I mean, you are a veteran on the team at this point. Yeah. How did it feel when you made the team the second time around, even though you, I'm sure you already kind of had in the back of your mind that you were going to be there. Yeah. I mean, I think that time um, it was a little different because, you know, one, I expected to be on the team. So I think having that expectation um, was something and it wasn't necessary. I don't want people to get the wrong idea that, you know, I expect to be on the team because I had been on it for so long. I expect to be on the team because I know I knew I was one of the top 17 players in the country. And that's really what I wanted to make sure that I was continuing to do at home was to make sure that my training matched that level. And so going into that triad, it was a definitely different mentality. I was, I knew I was going to be relied upon to play some, some big minutes and uh, to actually, you know, contribute rather than being a part of the break line to give the other two lines a break. And so for me, um, I wanted to make sure that I was on the team, but at the same time, I, wanted to make sure that I was able to deliver, you know, a top level, uh, top level performance when it really counted. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a different, different mindset going in once you've already been on the team for a while where it goes from, um, you know, and I think some people maybe when they're new to the sport or just haven't, uh, maybe reached that point, don't understand. They might think like, Oh, he's, he just thinks he's going to be here. And it's like, well, no, I mean, I'm, you know, the reason that, the individuals are on the team in the first place because they put in that time and effort and they expect to be there because of the amount of work that they're putting in outside of that. And, um, so that's, Mm -hmm. that's awesome. Now going to Sochi as opposed to Vancouver, this is your second Paralympics. What did, how did it feel going to another Paralympics? What was it like? Um, I mean, did it feel like same thing or totally different or just like a blend of those? Um, I think it was pretty different. Uh, so, you know, most Paralympics, they're, they're different, but they're the same. You know, you have the, the village, you have the dining hall, you have the, the venues and being in Sochi was really awesome because it, you know, it was, you know, 50 degrees and 
awesome outside every day. So didn't yeah. really feel like you were playing in the winter Paralympics. Right. Yeah. But, you know, it was a, a different, le- a different type of dynamic because I wanted to help show guys around that it had never been there. And, you know, we had two young guys, Declan Farmer and Brody Roybal, who are now some of the best players in the world. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that they had a positive experience because part of it was I had had those guys show me around in Vancouver. And, you know, I wanted to reciprocate that for the younger guys. And, you know, even for a guy like you that hadn't been to a Paralympics before, you know, you want to make sure that the transition's easy and smooth. And um, especially for the, the younger kids, you want to make sure that they feel comfortable in where they're at. I mean, both those guys were pretty mature for their age. And so I wanted, I just wanted to make sure that they knew that, you know, everybody had their back and we were all looking like the, the goal was to repeat as gold medalist. You know, it had never been done. Um, but I don't, I don't think if you go in with any expectations less, um, you're actually going to stand a chance at achieving it. Yeah. And so you are the first among the back-to-back gold medalists, first, first sled hockey players with that title. What was that like? winning back-to-back gold medals uh, at the Paralympics? I mean, it was was awesome, but, you know, it it was totally different than in Vancouver. You know, we lost the semi, or not the semifinal, the uh, last preliminary game against Russia. We lost that two to one. And I, but I think the biggest thing I took away from that was the fact that, you know, we, we all lost, but anybody that did an interview, anybody talked in the locker room, it was all positive. It was, yeah, well, we just didn't get that, but we're going to get them next time. Like, we did a lot of things right. Like the bounces just didn't go our way. And I think that positive positivity really helped us going into the semifinal game against Canada because we weren't down on ourselves and we, we were focused right away on, okay, well, we're just going to have to play Canada to, to win a gold medal. Like that's just how it's going to be. And then to play Russia in, in that last game was, was unreal. I mean, the crowd roared, even if they were in their, in their own zone and they had just touched the puck. Like they were like, they scored a goal. It was so crazy to be a part of. And you know, when that Russian guy passed you the puck and you just took <laughs> it in and just roofed it, that was, that was, I don't know. I, I still remember trailing you on that play. And I was like, damn, I got a really good spot for, uh, <laughs> for this goal to watch this. And Oh man, I, it was, it was incredible. And to have everybody, you know, I remember being on the ice the last like three seconds, uh, Paul Schaus made a line change and, uh, you and Rico were just battling in their zone. I look up at the clock with like four seconds left. I'm like, there's no way they're getting down. So I just turned tail and uh, skated over to cash and we had that big pile on, but man, that was, it was, it was totally different because of the adversity we had gone through. But the fact that we were able to pull together and, and eke that one out one, nothing um, in front of their home crowd was just, was absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, I do. Actually, when you're talking about that, I do remember, I don't, I don't even remember feeling nervous about Canada because I was so mad that we got beat by Russia that I was like, I just want to play Russia again. I don't even care about this Canada game. I just want to get it out of the way and get straight back to Russia. And I didn't even, it wasn't even because it was the gold medal game. I just, I just think it's that mindset that we all have on the team of, we don't like being beat by a team. And so then once we get beat by that team, I mean, it it could have been any, any kind of tournament and we would have been like, oh no, we need to play Russia again. So we, we got to get this other game out of the way and get going. (laughs) Oh yeah. It's just on to the next one. We'll, we'll get it. And then on to the main prize. Cause I mean, we were there for a gold medal, nothing less. So Canada was standing in the way of just playing for one. So we were going to, we were going to make sure we gave them our best effort. Definitely. And so you're back to back gold medalist. You are on top of the world. You're continuing to play. Uh, you're still in college. What, and, and then when <laughs> I know that writing a book had to somehow fall in line with all those things, what, when did that happen? Um, so it happened, uh, after the Pyeongchang games, oh. um, I, t- Oh, well I'm totally wrong yeah. then. So it was after Pyeongchang that you decided to write a book. Yeah. I mean, I always kind of thought about wanting to write a book, but it never really got to the point where I was like, Oh yeah, I'm a hundred percent writing a book. That was, uh, that was after Pyeongchang. Oh, okay. Well, let's let's continue talking about what happened between 2014 and 2018 for you then. Oh, man, a lot happened. Um, well, we ended up winning that world championship in Buffalo. Um, you got named captain of the team in 2015, and then me and Nico uh, Landeros were, were named alternates. And so, you know, to be able to wear a letter was, I'm sure you know, it was just an unreal experience to be able to 
you know, not only say you were a captain, but also to, to have a little bit more responsibility. And, you know, I'd been on the team for, I don't know, four or five years by then. And so it was at that point where I was, I, I almost expected myself to have some, some sort of leadership role, um, just more to want to give back. And I knew kind of the person I was and, you know, I was somebody that really wanted to, to lead the team, whether or not I was going to be a captain or not. And so that I think kind of started changing. And, you know, 2015 was by far my best season. You know, I was, I was in the gym all the time. I was a rink rat. Um, but I had a lot of great people help me out. You know, the, the Lindenwood university ice rink, the guy would just go and open the doors to the rink any day, any day I wanted, wow. whenever there was nothing going on, he let me skate for as long as I wanted it with, uh, Steve cash. So, you know, I don't think most people understand that it's not just me going out saying, Hey, I'm going to get in the gym and I'm going to get on the ice. It's people that are, that are willing to help and to contribute to that because they see your passion. And, you know, I, I was really lucky and I couldn't have done it without those guys. And, you know, I think 2015 was really a season that changed from, Hey, I'm a, I'm a pretty good player to I'm going to dominate anybody that wants to try to, to go past me because not because I know I'm better, but because, I'm, that's just who I am. I'm not going to let you buy me. And I really think I took pride in, in developing that defensive game um, and to complement the offensive game, especially being a defenseman. You're kind of the last line of defense before the goalie. So um, I've kind of changed my motto now. I, I like to play defense by playing offense and just keeping the puck and not turning it over and getting it to our forwards and letting them go. Um, but then, you know, in 2017, we ended up uh, – playing in a world championship uh, in March, I believe in, in uh, Pyeongchang is kind of the test event for the, uh, the Paralympics. And uh, I guess that January or February, we ended up losing coach tower to pancreatic cancer. And, you know, for me, that was a huge blow. I mean, I remember I was uh, working through a program, uh, Dick sporting goods. It was through the U S Olympic committee. And uh, I remember just checking my phone for no real reason. I really never, checked it a lot when I was working, but I remember looking, I just, I had this feeling because coach Sauer wasn't at that camp before. And I was like, you know what, let me, let me just look. And so I looked at my phone and I saw an email from Dan Brennan, our general manager. And it just, the subject line was coach Sauer. And I was like, I don't know what's going on. So I opened it. I really, I read it. Coach Sauer had passed and, and that hit us hard. I think, I don't want to say that was the reason we ended up losing in the world championship that year, but you know, I think it was a huge blow, but it was also, a motivating factor because we wanted to win for him. Um, but you know, we didn't that year. And then, uh, and then it was just heading into Pyeongchang. We wanted to make sure that we were going to, we were going to do what it took to end up, end up winning for him. Yeah, definitely. And that's what you guys did. So what was that like now your third time around going to the Paralympics in Pyeongchang? It was weird. Um, it was way different because, you know, my life was drastically different. I was working a uh, full-time job. I was playing at the same t- I was playing on the national team. Um, I got named captain that year. And so it was a really different dynamic, mostly because I probably wasn't actually ready for uh, the captaincy. But, you know, sometimes you just got to learn by fire. You got to learn trial by fire. And, you know, I'm glad that we had those experiences. And uh, we ended up going into Pyeongchang. Uh, we won our first three games pretty easily because – you know, Declan and Brody are some of the best in the world. And we kind of rode those guys pretty hard. Um, And then in the semifinal, we ended up playing Italy, won that pretty handily. And then we ended up playing Canada um, in the gold medal game. But before the gold medal game, we ended up losing uh, two of our best defensemen. Uh, Both of them ended up leaving the the Paralympics. The one had a, it was a a doping related incident. And so um, a couple hours before the gold medal game, we find out we're down our two of our best defensemen. We have a guy, uh, Jack Wallace, um, who had played defense a little bit, uh, was mostly a forward for us that year. And he ended up having to move back on D. Um, one of my good buddies, Billy Hanning, who he didn't expect to play that game at all. And, uh, he, uh, he, me and, uh, Steve Cash were in the starting lineup. And so the two defensemen and the, the goalie were all from, uh, St. Louis. And so that was a, a really special moment. Nice. Um, just because of, you know, who Billy is as a person, you know, he works so hard for, for everything he's gotten. And he's somebody that, you know, I look up, I looked up to a lot, um, just over the course of, of the, those couple of years he was on the team. And, you know, I remember sitting on the bench, uh, when we were talking a little bit, um, uh, ended up playing a ton that game just because we were so shorthanded. Um, and coach, I guess, wasn't sure what he had in everybody 
So um, we were sitting on the bench, me and Billy were talking, and I said something about like the puck being different because the pucks we were using in Pyeongchang, the logo was bl- uh, blue. And for this, this puck was orange. I looked at him. I was like, yeah, you know, it's just weird. I was trying to retrieve that puck and it just looked different and something. And he was like, well, yeah, I guess that's like the gold medal game puck. And, you know, here we are, you know, with five minutes left in the game talking about the, what color the puck is when we probably should be focusing <laughs> on, you know, actually winning the game. Uh, Cause we ended up going down one, nothing in the first period. Uh, Canada scored a goal that we were on for. And then, uh, Right about four minutes, I guess it was right after uh, Billy and I had that chat, I looked up at the, the scoreboard, and there was only four minutes left in the game. Uh, and I kept looking. I thought, like, hey, we might want to get something going. We kind of need to, to, you know, score a goal here, at least tie it up and make things interesting. And uh, so we ended up pulling Steve, our goalie, and with a minute left, Canada got pretty much a breakaway. And, uh, and they took the shot, and it hit off the post. So there was no goal. It hit off the post, and Brody uh, Roybal picked it up. And I truly believe, you know, I'm not somebody who's a, a crazy believer in the supernatural or anything like that. But, you know, I'm, I'm betting Coach Sauer just moved that net just a little bit to blow that puck uh, just wide of the net because he didn't <laughs> want us uh, getting scored on. Right. And uh, I don't think we ever passed the puck mo- past that point. I think Brody threw it up and one of the Canadians got it and somebody hit him and it advanced the puck a little bit. And then another Canadian got it and we hit him, hit him again and the puck advanced and, uh, finally, the puck ended up in their zone on the hands of Declan Farmer, and he put it in with 37 seconds left, and we ended up tying the game. And I think one of the biggest things that I think anything that says, if you can say anything about Declan Farmer, as soon as he scored that goal, he had that look of, oh, my God, we got, we just scored. Uh, but t- two seconds later, he was sitting there going, guys, we got to calm down. we got to make sure we make it out of these 37 <laughs> seconds. And, I, it was just, it was such an experience. And then we ended up winning four minutes, three or four minutes into overtime on probably the longest ship I've ever taken. Not too proud of it, but I'm glad that we ended up winning. And uh, that was just, it, it was so cool to be able to win and, and win in the memory of Coach Sauer and to, just to understand everything that had gone on from the beginning of that Paralympics to right before the gold medal game to through the gold medal game and the adversity we have, were able to overcome. I mean, that was it. I want to say my first one in Vancouver was, was the most special, but that one, just the way everybody reacted and the way everybody came together, I think was, was really something that I'm going to remember forever. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I was watching it and I actually, I hate to say it, but when you guys, that last, before you guys scored the goal to tie it up to go into overtime, I was watching and as soon as I saw it's cash get pulled, I literally had the remote in my hand and I was about to turn it off. Cause I was like, I don't really, I don't know if I want to watch this. Like, (laughs) I don't Mm -hmm. know if I really want to watch these guys lose. Like I know all these guys personally, they've, they've, you know, they mean a lot to me. They've done a lot of hard work. And then I was like, you can't turn it off. You got to watch it. You know, it's like, it's like one of those things you don't really want to watch. So you got your hands over your face and you got your, your fingers (laughs) spread open. Right. And, uh, Mm -hmm. and then as soon as Declan scored, or I'm sorry, as soon as it hit off the post, I was like, Oh, 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 we got some energy here. And then when Brody picked it up and yeah, you're right. It was a little bit of a, crazy situation getting it back up the ice but then when he scored I was like oh we got this like that's we're good and um I can't even imagine like even talking about it I feel like my heart rate's going up but I can't even imagine being on the ice when that was going on I mean you had to be just wanting to jump out of the sled right oh there was there's nothing matching just scoring and deflating a team like that I mean it was it was a goal that like I can vividly remember because I ended up being behind the Canadian net. For those kids out there that are playing hockey as a defenseman, don't ever go behind the other team's net. <laughs> um, but anyway, I remember looking through the net, I saw the goalie of the rock on his side, like dove, diving out. And I saw the puck on Declan's stick, and I'm like, oh my gosh, we're going to score here. And I saw it go top top, top corner, and I was just, it, it, it was, I don't even know how to describe it, man. It was just the coolest, one of the coolest things I've ever been a part of, just the way the way we came together was something that, you know, was really just fantastic for me, but to be able to see all the hard work and, and, you know, take advantage of that opportunity, you know, Canada could have scored and put us out of that, but, you know, we ended up having Brody there to to pick up that puck after hit it off the post. If he had given up on the play and, you know, stayed back by the blue line, Canada might, might've had the chance to get that puck again and put it in for good this time. So, yeah, you know, I think, the most of anything it shows you just never give up on the play until the final buzzer goes. Exactly. 
And so now you're a three-time gold medalist. You're sitting there uh, listening to the USA national anthem. What, I mean, just a ton of emotions or what? Yeah. I mean, uh, I ended up holding up that, uh, we had a, a banner made for coach Sauer. It was a JS above that, the USA hockey, uh, symbol, or I don't know, one of the, oh, like crest one of the thing. crests for it. And, you know, that, that was probably the most proud I've ever been. Cause I knew he was with us there and he just, he, you, he gave us so much. And, you know, for us to be able to do that for, for him was, was something that, you know, I'll always remember. And, you know, we were so off key on that national anthem. We were singing along and I mean, just like we always are, I don't think anybody on our team's good singers, <laughs> which if we're going to keep winning, we might want to start getting lessons, right, but, some vocal lessons. you know, but it, you, you know how it is, you know, everybody's screaming the words, most people, I mean, hopefully everybody knows them, but you know, you're yelling, <laughs> you're, you're so excited and it's just, it's so off key, but, but that's the best moment is just, you're sitting together, you're all, you know, shoulder to shoulder everybody's draped over each other and you just, you, you're so happy because, you know, that's the pinnacle, you know, it's a once every four years chance of a lifetime. And you never really know, you know, I've been to three, one all, and we've won all three, but you never really know when you're going to get back and you never know what can happen because, you know, the game's so fast and anything can happen. Yeah, for sure. And it's only getting faster. I mean, I feel like, I feel like every time I watch these games, they just get better and better, and it's just getting so much. I mean, the peck handling and the passing, and it's just getting so much better. Oh, it's it's crazy the way the sports advance, even since I started. Yeah, and I guess that's something good to talk about. What what is the? Uh, I mean, what do you what do you attribute to that happening? Like, why do you think the sport has gone from uh, the way it has from when you started playing to now? Um, I think part of it's exposure. I think part of it's, you know, getting more players involved. Um, but I think exposure is a huge part of it in, in all of it because, you know, in Vancouver, we ended up going and we were streamed online. That was the only way you could watch. And then, you know, in, in Sochi, our gold medal game was live on NBC in at like 11 in the morning East Coast time. So to have so many people sit there and go, that's really cool um, is one thing. But to have little kids that are sitting in their, their living room or wherever they're watching and to go, I want to do that. Um, I think that's a big reason the sports advance because you're getting more people involved and you're getting athletes that want to get better and that are going to find ways to get better. But I think part of it also is the, the people we have giving back, you know, like you, like um, I think our whole development team staff is former players between Mike Blayback, who was a goalie in 2010 uh, Kip St. Germain played in, nine, I think, 98, 02, and 06. And uh, Craig Brady, who was on the national team in 2013. Like, we have guys that are willing to, to give back to the sport to help the next generation. And I think that that's huge for passing on, you know, the little tidbits. And um, But we have our national team really involved in, you know, learn to skate programs and in their local teams. And I think that does a lot for bringing up the the level of the sport and the speed of play because, Every, if everybody wants to be the fastest in the world, well, you're going to have an arms race more or less uh, of guys wanting to get really fast or really good at puck handling or really good goal scorers. Yeah, and I'll add that guys like Lonnie Hen. I mean, we kind of touched on this with uh, Lipset back in episode two of how guys like Lonnie Hanna are the reason that myself, Rico, Roman, and Jen Lee um, ended up playing and doing as well as we did because he kind of saw where we were at and what we were doing and was there to coach us. I mean, no matter what, even if we weren't going to make the national team, but he was there for us and, and helped us kind of, kind of reach that spot. So I think, I mean, I think that's totally right. And that it's the community helping the community get stronger. And then, and then even, I guess, just the, you know, practices and, and even on the national team, you know, the, the best way to get better is to go up against the best guys. And if you're doing that every single practice, you're only going to get better. So. Yeah. I think that's a huge part is, is just the mentality I think we've had. Cause you know, early on it was just, it was almost more of a hobby to be on the national team. And now like you got to work at it. And our practices now with, with uh, our current coach, David Hoff are so competitive all the time. Like it's, constant one-on-one battles two-on-two battles three-on-twos one-on-twos two-on-ones like it's so competitive now and it forces you to be at your best even you know you might not have be having the best practice of your life and but it makes the game so much easier and so I think that really really helps by 
practicing against the best so that you can be the best you. Yeah. So if you're listening and you keep shying away from that kid that you know is going to make you look bad, just keep going up against him and one day you'll figure it out. Uh, so exactly. yeah. And then with that, you're, you're a three time gold medalist, which is amazing. You've just finished up. I'm sure there's a lot of relief in, I mean, I know there's a lot of relief in finishing with a gold medal at the end of a game. So you got some downtime and then when does deciding to write a book happen or I guess get the book on paper happen? Um, I think it started right around October of 2018. Um, cause so basically after Pyeongchang, I realized that I didn't have a very good Paralympics. I wasn't very sharp. And I realized that part of it was, was working, was working full time was really droning on me. And I, I've always been somebody that wanted to, to, to kind of make it for myself. And so I ended up quitting my job. Um, I ended up going in, uh, basically becoming a motivational speaker and a uh, keynote speaker. And then, uh, somebody, JJ O'Connor actually had said, Hey, why don't you write a book? It'll help give you, help you supplement your speaking a little bit and it'll help you with that. And so I thought about it and thought about it. And I was like, you know what, that'd be, that could be kind of fun. And so I was like, I have no idea how to start writing a book. Um, <laughs> yeah. do I just like, you know, start typing in word? Do I like write it down? Like, what do I do? And uh, I talked to Taylor Lipset a little bit and he had told me that he had talked to a guy who was a, a book coach and, you know, being an athlete, I was like, I got a coach, like, perfect. I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. Um, he actually helped, uh, Kevin Rempel. I was actually on a call with him this morning. He's a, he's a former Canadian national team player. He played in Sochi. And, uh, so he less, Kletke, who's the the book coach, he helped him write his book. So I reached out to him, and Les was is a really like straightforward guy. He was a little little abrasive a little bit at the beginning, but <laughs> he he never came off as like I I know better than you. It was like this is just how I've done it in the past. I know this works. We're gonna get this. We're gonna get through this. If you really want to do it, let's try it. So um, I ended up having a book coach. I wrote the whole thing myself. So. Um, Les and I would basically do an interview really similar to this, actually, um, where I went through, I think I picked 25 topics and I said, okay, you know what, I'm going to go through and I want to talk about this. So, you know, I want to talk about Sochi or I want to talk about Pyeongchang or being captain or growing up with no legs, like things like that. And we do an interview, he'd write an outline for me. So he'd say, okay, write a hundred words about this thing write 150 words about this. This is your introduction. This is your story. This is your lesson. This is um, what you want people to take, take away from, from your book. And so I ended up writing that from October till I think January. Um, it only took me about three months to write. Oh wow! And yeah, it was, uh, it, I was on a strict, like two chapters a week um, regiment with, with less. So he, he helped keep me accountable. And then the publishing process took the longest of anything. And I had a book published by September, uh, August, I guess, August, September, somewhere around there. And then I ended up officially releasing it in October. So um, it's, it's been kind of, it was really cool. Uh, like I said earlier, it was really kind of cathartic to be able to, to write and, and truly understand kind of what I had learned over the, over my life. And uh, mostly focus on the years of the national team, because it's really helped shape me to who I am. And um, it's, it's been a ton of fun to, to learn from so many people, you know, a guy like you, I got to, to watch in, in Norway was something that I really talked about a lot. And, uh, to watch you ended up, I don't know for people that are unfamiliar with the situation, you and Rico got pulled off the bench in the very beginning of the game because we dressed too many guys and you guys came into the locker room, just like, whatever, like we'll get in next game. It'll be fine. And, you know, I really thought about what that kind of impact that had on me and, you know, I think that just goes to show you never really know the impact you can have on somebody. So you got to make sure that you're, you're always acting in a way that if you were looking up to you, you'd want, this is what you'd want them to take away. That's awesome. I didn't even, and it was, so I've, I've, I've read half the book. I, I'm not going to lie. I tried to speed read it before I got to this interview so that I could uh, just have some sort of something to stand on with the book. Uh, but I couldn't between everything I had going on, but I made it through half the book and he's talking about the chapter team first, which I personally think is the best chapter. Uh, but <laughs> I it, just a little bias there, huh? Just a little bias, but no, it, and, and I didn't, when I read that, I was like, no way. I didn't realize that that was such a big 
big thing at the time for Rico and I to be so, um, uh, I don't know, just nonchalant about not being there on the ice for the game and having to get undressed and get dressed and go up into the stands and watch and, you know, and because both of us coming from military backgrounds, we understand that that's just how it is. Like you're part of a team and you're not the one in charge. So you don't make the rules or get to decide who gets to do what. And when you're told what to do and how to do it, then that's it. And um, so when I read that, it was funny. I was, I was laying there and reading and I was like, no way. And, and so it was really cool uh, that that had that impact. And I think it's great that you do mention that. And I, I, the only reason I'm saying what I'm saying is because Josh is right. Like it's, it's those little things. And I wasn't thinking at the time, like, well, I'm going to act like it doesn't bother me so that Josh can put it in a book, you know, <laughs> for mm-hmm. four or five years later, you know, I was just doing it because that's the way, that's the way I was, I was brought up and that's the way I was raised. So um, I think that was just something really, really cool to touch on. And I, I really enjoy the book for anybody that's listening. It's definitely something you should read. It's not, um, it's got a ton of lessons in there. I'm actually, so I picked out a, I picked out a paragraph. It's nothing too long. And I think it really is a, is just kind of a good paragraph that will explain what I guess Josh and, and his outlook and this and that, and what, it, here's what he writes. Just as everyone faces challenges and failure, we all have opportunities and potential. An opportunity may be helping a neighbor clean off their car after a snowstorm or a chance to try out for the Olympic team. The potential for success through those opportunities is in everyone, but it's up to you to maximize it and take advantage of those opportunities. Success could be winning a gold medal, but it also could be raising your child to live out their dream. Life constantly changes the shots it throws at us and it never makes easy <laughs> the shots it throws at us and it never makes things easy. In order to conquer that and to truly succeed, we need to rely on each other and keep working and learning. And I picked that paragraph because as soon as I read it, I was like, oh, this is perfect for people wanting to listen. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing this podcast because I want people to go and be gold medalists. I want them to be the best version of themselves and hoping that all these life experiences from guys like yourself, Josh, are, are going to help them to realize their true potential. And uh, again, that's from his book, Lessons Learned. Definitely check it out. So with that, now that you've written a book, is that how does that feel? Because I, I feel like that feels like something that you'd be really like excited about, but feel kind of classy about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm excited just because, you know, I know, I know it's going to have a positive impact on people. And that's, I think, been my ultimate goal is just to impact as many people in a good way as possible and to, to help people because for me, I've had so many people like, you know, coach Sauer, like you, like Andy Yoey, like Lonnie Hanna, even like guys that just, you know, they help you along. And, you know, for me, I want to be able to, to give back because I think it'd be a disservice if I did. I think, you know, I've had so many people go out of their way for me that if I didn't end up going out of my way for somebody else, like I'm not really doing justice for the people that helped me. And so, you know, it's something I'm extremely proud of to be able to do and put it to paper because you know, just like anything, it was a grind. There were chapters I didn't feel like writing. There were things that I probably wanted to leave out, but I, I wanted to, to talk about because, you know, people are going to go through it. And so for me, like, it's something that I'm excited about, but I think I'm more excited for people to read it because I know that they're going to be able to take something away from it and they're going to be able to learn and, like you said, become the best version of themselves because, you know, I don't want to go and be the the next Josh Sweeney. I don't want to go and be another coach sour. I want to be the best version of Josh Pauls that I can be. And, you know, what that looks like, I don't even know yet. Um, but, you know, I know I'm going to figure it out. And, you know, I got a lot of good people in my corner that are helping me, help me do that. Yeah, it's definitely, I think making the Paralympics or even the Olympics is done. It, like, I almost feel like you're just the vessel you know, like with all the support that I've had and from hearing what you said, it sounds exactly the same where you're kind of like the vessel that everybody puts their time and, and effort into because they can see that you have it. And that as long as you do the work and you take what they're willing to provide and, and, and learn from it, then it's almost like everybody that's helped you along that way is, is winning that medal at the same time. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's what I tell everybody. The best part about a gold medal is giving it away, you know, 
giving it over to your parents and saying, thanks for help driving me to practice every day or, you know, handing it over to, you know, to coach Sauer's wife and saying, you're, you're, you know, your husband helped me with so much or, you know, things like that. It's, it, you love giving it, giving it and showing it to people and you never know the impact it can have on, on others, but you know, they helped you and you wouldn't have been able to do it without it. And I think that's probably the worst part about any major sporting event is you see the athlete in the moment executing it, but you don't ever see everything that went into it. And I'm not just talking about how much they practice or the little things they do extra. You don't ever, you don't see, you know, their relationship at home or how supportive their spouse or their, um, or their kids are, or their parents are, you know, you don't ever see those little interactions that can have such a huge impact. So in the topic of helping others for people interested in getting into sled hockey and potentially wanting to take it to the national level. And I think you're a great person to ask this question. What advice do you have for them? So, I mean, this may contradict everything I've said on this, um, (laughs) but the onus has to be on you. Like, yeah, you're going to have a lot of people help you out. Um, but in the long run, like if you want to make it, you're going to, you're going to have to put in the effort to make it because, you know, I hear so many people sit there and go, Oh, well, you know, it's, I work all this time and then I don't want to go to the gym. So the only time I can go to the gym is at this time. And then all the machines are pit taken up and, you know, ice time's really expensive. So I can't always get that, but you know, there's always a way to overcome that obstacle, you know, whether it's, you know, you work at the rink and you get a discount and you're able to, to skate an open skate or you pay $10 in skate during a free skate. So you can work on your stride and, and things like that. Or, you know, you're, you, you just find time to, to work out or you get up a little earlier than you may want to. Um, but if you're truly passionate about it, you're going to make it happen. And so I think that's, that's probably the, the biggest piece of advice as I can say, because I hear so many people sit there and go, well, I would, but somebody else is holding me back. But in reality, the only person, if, if you truly wanted it, you'd make it happen. And I think for me, especially like, you know, my family and, you know, my uh, fiance now, she's been such a a big part of, you know, helping me along the way she's been, you have to have that support system. So, you know, that may end up being, you know, your family members, it might be your friends, it might be your teammates on your, your local team. Um, You got to make sure you have that buy-in because as much as it's going to be on you, you're going to need that support to, to help you reach that pinnacle and to become the best version of yourself. And so, I mean, two really opposite ends of the spectrum advice, um, but, but both are necessary in order to, to make it to that top level and just wanting to understand, wanting to have that competitive spirit, I think is one thing, like, like you said, you don't want to just go against guys you know you can beat and you're going to get beat a couple times if you go always go against the best guy on your team or in your area or whoever it might be but ultimately that's going to make you better and you got to make sure that you want to to constantly better yourself so you know what every time you I went into practice you know when I was 17 years old against national team guys and I'd go in and say I'm going to stop him this time or I'm going to get around him and score a goal this time and most of the time I didn't but when I finally did, that made it that much sweeter because I, I kept telling myself, hey, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to stop him. And it, it like I said, it's going to take a grind to, to actually get there. But for me, that's the be- biggest part is talking yourself up and making sure that, you know, you could you execute on your uh, on your promises. OK. And then more of a specific question that I got from social media. How would you recommend to increase speed and flexibility in the sport of sled hockey? Ooh, that's a good one. Right. Um, so flex, I'm going to start with flexibility cause I'm gonna have to think on the speed thing. Um, so flexibility is stretching, it's foam rolling, it's, um, things like using a lacrosse ball to, to kind of roll out your muscles. Um, but just like lifting weights, like you have to work at flexibility. I know my, my trainer now in St. Louis, Jeff Lavecchio, he's having me do all this T spine stuff and I, I'm not going to lie. I'm awful at it. Um, but it's something that you have to work on and, you know, I'm stretching to make sure that, you know, I I can stay flexible and I can hopefully compete for longer than if I just not stretched at all. So it's finding ways to do those dynamic stretches and, um, even static stretches. Like it, it's always going to be a grind. You might not be great at it, but the more you do it, the better you'll get and the longer it'll help your career. And so for me, as far as speed, it's, it's one working on on the ice to make sure, making sure that, 
you know, you have that quick zero to 60 um, acceleration. Um, that's a big, I think that's probably a bigger asset than um, just straight line speed over the long haul because, you know, like, you know, you're tr- turning so much and there's so many stops and starts that if you have better acceleration, you're a lot of times you're going to win those puck battles. And so for me, you know, making sure I'm focusing on my triceps uh, to get that explosive power, uh, focusing on the strength and uh, the durability of my lat- lateral uh, lats, um, working that back. So whether it's doing pull-ups, whether it's doing lat pull-down, um, Jeff has me doing a ton of different stuff. So sometimes I'm doing, you know, real heavy, um, you know, I'm doing pull-ups, I'm doing lat pull-downs, but then I'm also doing um, explosive movements too. So you want to train those quick twitch and then those slow twitch muscles at the same time. Uh, Cause you know, the more you do all that, I think that'll really help your speed in the long run. But, and, you know, finally on the speed topic, making sure your core strong is a, is another big one because the le- uh, core and I, I would say grip strength, I think, because the less energy you can lose by, you know, your sled moving a little bit, or even the less energy you can lose from your stick hitting the ice all the way through your arms. Um, I think that'll, that'll help your speed. It might be incremental, um, but it can make a difference. Very well. So what is next for you? Well, I'm going to keep playing hockey as long as I can. Um, let's see. Otherwise, you know, I got a couple of speaking engagements coming up this year, so I'm really excited about those. So I, I'm working with a guy named Ben Newman here in St. Louis. Um, he was named one of the top 50 speakers in the world, I think, or at least in the U.S. I'm pretty sure it was the world, though. And uh, he works with, like, the Alabama Crimson Tide football team. Um, a couple other division one football teams and as well as like the Miami dolphins, like the dude's just unreal. And so I've been able to work with him a little bit to help improve my speaking, uh, you know, speaking game, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, so as far as that goes, I think that's something that I'm really trying to focus on heading into 2020 and, uh, and then, you know, I'm getting married in 2021. So I've got some wedding planning to do. So that's definitely something that's, uh, on my to do list. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. I, um, yeah, it's, that's, that's a lot. I mean, I, you know, it's a lot, that's a lot of stuff you have going on and and on top of, don't forget everyone listening, that's on top of still working out, playing for the national team and, um, everything else he has to, all the stretching he has to do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's why uh, I see a trainer so that he can, I don't have to think a lot when I'm in the gym. He just tells me what to do. Yeah, and that actually brings up a really good point that I wasn't going to talk about and I think is good to talk about. You know, we talk about getting help from individuals for other things outside of that and equipment and whatnot. Uh, But I really think finding a good coach that you enjoy working with and that can help you is very beneficial, not just for the physical gains of, you know, maybe weightlifting or getting faster or stretching or whatever it is, but also mentally so that that's one less thing that you have to put your mental energy into and you can just show up and do your workout or, you know, skate or whatever it is that, that you need to do. And I mean, do you agree? Oh, hundred percent. Because I mean, I'll, I'm not going to lie. I don't like working out. I'm not a fan. Like I, I do it cause I have to, and cause I want to stay on the national team, but I'm not just going to go to the gym just because like, I, I'm probably going to get way fat when I, I finish playing. <laughs> but you know, for me, like I talked to, to Jeff, who's my trainer and you know, he'd never coached an adaptive athlete. He works mostly with uh, youth and uh, pro hockey players in the St. Louis area. And so he was like, I don't know what I'm really doing with you. I'll try it. I'm not going to like tell you I'm going to be great, but I'm going to work at it as much as you're going to have to work at it with me. And so I I think what he does for me, at least he makes it fun to come into the gym every day because I never dread going to the gym. Um, I mean, you know, when he says, okay, max pull ups or, Hey, we're going to get on the bike for a couple sprints. Like I'm never saying that's fun, but you know, we have such a good relationship, you know, while we're working out, like we're, we're shooting the breeze, we're having fun. And, you know, every day, like he's, he's my biggest cheerleader because he's telling me, he's like, you got this, we're going to go up a weight. Like we go up 10 pounds and he's like cheering and hooting and hollering. And, you know, <laughs> it, it lets me just kind of do my thing. It lets me pick things up and put them down and, you know, get heavier every time. So I think the less, 
effort, I guess you have to put in the, the more, the less you're, the more you're going to avoid burnout. Cause for a while I was getting burned out, but finding, finding a guy like him was, was hugely instrumental. And, and like I said before about coach Sauer, you find a way to, to really, you know, add some fun into it and take the, Oh my gosh, I have to be at my very best all the time. You know, I'm just, and instead you're just sitting there going, I'm just going to go out and play hockey because you're, you're trained to do that. Then I think that's immensely beneficial for anybody. Yeah, that's a good point. You've been doing this for a while and you're still getting better. And I, I think that what you said is, a, is the reason why. So that's, that's really cool. I didn't even think about that until you said it. I was like, wow, yeah, that's true. He's been doing this a while and he's still improving, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, I know. Normally people plateau, but I'm trying to trying to put that off as long as I can. You start to plateau, they're just going to throw you back on offense. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I don't want that. That's way harder. So I'm I'm happy where I'm at on defense. Yeah. No, and I think you've been you've been looking great. So with that, is there anything else that you would like to add? Um, aside from buy my book and read about Josh Sweeney, uh, <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, it's been great talking with you today and and catching back up a little bit because, you know, I think it's it's really cool watching how you've transitioned from you know, winner guy over to, to triathlon and now doing a podcast. I mean, it just goes to show that I think elite athletes have to have that, have that one unifying mentality of I'm going to be good at something. It may not always be the same thing. It may not be the same thing as yesterday, but you're going to work at it just like anything. And so I think that's something that most people may not think about, but I think they really need to, to take a look at and understanding how, how you've been able to successfully do, you know, at least three things on top of being a parent, a husband, everything like that. I think, you know, I think that goes to show kind of what I was talking about earlier of, you know, just be the best version of you. You're not going to be, you're unique. And so you're not, you're not going to be the best at everything or the same things as other people, but by doing what you've been able to do, you're becoming the best version of Josh Sweeney. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And for people listening, I did not pay him. We did not talk about that. He said that all on his own. So (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'll sign a statement saying, and you can uh, put that up somewhere so that uh, people know I'm not lying. Right. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you again for taking time to be here. And uh, to all of you that took the time to listen today, we thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe to the Josh Sweeney podcast so you don't have to worry about missing the next one. Until next time.